Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zajaczkiewska, and thank you, Professor Valentin, for the nice introduction. Uh, this is uh, a historic event for the fifth Lion Conference. I was uh, very pleased to participate in one of the previous conferences, and congratulations for running such a good international collaborat collaboration, uh, uh, educational and scientific study. It is very important to acknowledge that Central Europe, uh, where we take Ukraine, especially Western Ukraine, as a part of its Central Europe, is the origin of big discoveries. And just to remind you very quickly, the, uh, my teacher, Hans Seri, who, who was the first to describe the, the human uh, stress and uh, experimental animals initially, uh, originated from here, from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The winner of two Nobel Prizes in Medicine, who got the uh, award to discovering the sensation of heat and touch in our fingers, uh, their discovery came because of the capsaicin uh, sensitive neurons. And capsaicin was isolated for the Hungarian red pepper by Professor Solcsányi at the University of Pitch. So, here it is. This year, Nobel Prize come from this. Uh, and uh, third, very relevant to the COVID-19, uh, do you know who is the discoverer of the mRNA vaccine for COVID-19? Uh, uh, Oksana Katalin knows it. Yes. Dr. Katalin Kariko, who is original from Seged, Central Europe, again. She discovered the messenger RNA-based uh, COVID-19 vaccine, and she was proposed for Nobel Prize. She did not get it this year, but I'm sure she will get it uh, next year. So this is just one illustration that why a smart lion is such a good venture, because it concentrates and radiates to international community the good science coming from here. So I will cover with a short update on the long uh, COVID in general, then on long COVID syndrome, a few slides, and, and finish with the stress interaction of this. So some definitions. Of course, um, everybody knows that uh, corona COVID-19 comes from this abbreviation. I don't like when people use it in small letters because it's an abbreviation, like ACTH, TSH. So it should be capitalized letter. And we know it's caused by this virus, which is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And unfortunately, it's a very new and very complex disease. That's the reason that we have another presentation on, on long COVID also, because here it is a problem like in the United States also. Uh, the symptoms and the signs uh, lasting for more than four weeks is the base one of the definition of long COVID. But also we know that uh, symptoms in healed patients can come back after four weeks or even longer. So there are changing definition of uh, uh, long COVID. This is the definition the, the, the NIH is, is using, but essentially it can uh, be modified probably in the next um, few years. And stress, uh, as defined by Hans Selye, uh, uh, my teacher, PhD uh, mentor, is the non-specific response of the body to any demand made upon it. This is his latest definition in 1974, but he always had the similar definition from the very beginning in the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, he just changed a little bit of the wording. And two major distinguishing factors. Stress is the response, and stressor is the agent which causes uh, stress. Since there is sometimes confusion about what is specific, what is non-specific, this is actually an updated slide from Hans Selye. I just simplified it. He used it to illustrate that every physical, chemical, biologic agent has a specific uh, the viruses cause specific in infections. Large doses of insulin cause hypoglycemia. In cold, we shiver. So these are very specific effects. 
But in addition, especially if the uh, stimulus is long standing, comes a non specific effect, the stressor effect. This is usually a narrow endocrine effect, which can be measured either by cortisol or uh, catecholamines, uh, uh, adrenaline secretion. And these are the non specific effects. So that's what Sally is meant by non specific response, because in addition, most of these agents have specific uh, effect also. So in my presentation, I will have three components. First is I will just show you some recent updates. As late as three days ago, uh, what is the situation with COVID uh, in the United States, in Ukraine, and a few other countries? And you will be surprised is that Ukraine is doing pretty well in international statistics as far as COVID-19 is concerned. I will show you some uh, uh, after organs involved, the new molecular and cellular mechanism of, of COVID, and uh, focus on later on, on long COVID, which is an ongoing and lingering response of the COVID-19. And then uh, finish up with the uh, new human stressor story, that indeed now there is a new defining and developing concept of post-COVID stress response. It's well, doc well documented now by neuroendocrine changes, especially with cortisol measure. And of course, finish with conclusion and a take home message. So here is the latest map of coronavirus cases in the United States. This comes as of this weekend. The New York Times has a very good interactive map. I liked it better than some of the other university like the John Hopkins studies. It's very good, very interactive. So there are th three major uh, peaks in the United States. Uh, the initial was the alpha variant, and the last peak on your right, of course, is the delta variant. But the sad statistics in the United States, and I will show you in a second why, is that we reached more than 700,000 deaths in the United States. And this is a tragic died of COVID, and this is a tragic number because the only other big epidemiologic disease caused by infectious agent was the influenza virus in, in um, 1918, 1990, and there the total death was 625,000. So that's the reason this 700,000 is a tragic uh, event of last weekend when we reached this number. Now, how this looks in, in global comparison? As you know, definitely the United States is not a shining star. Uh, we have a lot of cases still ongoing because there is resistance to vaccination. But there are other countries. Mongolia is not in good shape. Some of the European countries, Turkey is not in good shape. And even here, you can see that Ukraine looks better than the United States. This is an interactive map. If you click on it, you will get the specific data for every country. And this is fresh of this weekend. And look at just uh, compare the per capita, so, so percent of population getting uh, COVID-19. And just look at the share of the population. In the United States, one in eight people get it. Uh, in Ukraine, one in 18, so we are twice better than we, because you have 50% less incidence of COVID-19. And look at Hungary. Hungary is one in 12. It's worse than uh, Ukraine, and it's slightly different uh, from the United States. And death rates are equally uh, bad. In the United States, one death for every 482 patients. Uh, Ukraine and 749, so almost twice better than, than the United States. And you are definitely better than, than Hungary. One in 324 of these patients died. So that's the reason that, uh, you, that you should be proud. I know that I understand you have challenges with COVID-19, but you are among the best. And we, the United States and Hungary, are one of the worst. 
Very sad, but that's, that's the case. And this is due to partially for the, the, the vaccination rate. It is, is not very good in the United States, not the worst, but definitely something to come. And here is the demonstration of the sad mortality statistics. The uh, USA Today newspaper on Sunday, this Sunday, had this very dramatic picture. These are not flowers in Washington. These are individual white flags of this size. In the United States, when Biden became the president, they planted a white flag for each death in the United States. When Biden became president, there was about 500,000 planted in the Washington uh, 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 mon uh, monument area uh, in the big park. One flag, one person. And this is still going on. I was in Washington two weeks ago, and the number of plaques is increasing every day. And here is the sad statistics on the lower right. 620,000 died of influenza, which we thought was the worst uh, epidemic. And now we are more than 700. And this is still ongoing study, ongoing tragedy. So what are the major organs involved in COVID-19? We knew from clinical experience, and uh, unfortunately even the general population knows, the major organ affected is the, is the lung because that's what people are dying for. They cannot breathe, end up in ICU. But as the disease is progressing, we see that other organs are involved also. We see the liver enzymes increasing in some, especially long-standing cases. Kidney injuries demonstrated, and even the lower intestines are involved with diarrhea and other syndromes. The brain is definitely a, a big component of long, long COVID. Uh, eyes um, are involved, but the biggest is on the lower right is the heart and the vascular lesions. Because of our research being devoted on early vascular injury in the in, uh, uh, GI tract, we were pleased in quotation mark to see that even in the lung, it turns out the initial and most dramatic lesions is in endothelial cells. And this impartially explains the frequent thrombotic event, including the myocarditis, focal myocarditis, that we know that patients dying of COVID uh, will demonstrate. So here is the new cellular and molecular uh, pathogenesis of COVID-19. On the left, in the lower illustration, is the normal lung alveolus. These small alveoli sacs, as you know, are filled with air. It's lined by epithelial cells, but underneath is a, a small capillary, always lined by vascular endothelial cells. And we know from experience that the initial attack of coronavirus, which usually co comes by respiration in the nose and later on in the lung, are lined by epithelial cells. So the initial damage is uh, affecting the epithelial cells, but not the most dramatic. The major sustained damage is in the vascular endothelial cells, which is controlled by a large peptide. Most of you know the name VEGF Genesis. But actually, the very first name used for this peptide was not VEGF, but vascular permeability factor, VPF. Because the very same peptide, which is stored and, and secreted by fibroblasts, stored in collagen fibers, released in any injury, and causes vascular permeability. So because of the sudden release of VEGF or VPF, you have fluid, edema, in the alveolar sac. And this is the first demonstration of vascular, inju of, uh, 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 vascular injury and pulmonary injury. And also the clinicians know that if the edema persists, it's followed by inflammation. And that's how you get into pneumonia, for which uh, reason some people die. So here is an update from Science, the journal Science updating 
that indeed endothelial injury is a major factor in the pathogenesis of COVID-19. And some people call this in the United States as endotheliitis is the main pathogenic element in, in, in pathogenesis of COVID-19 because it triggers a cascade of events. And this was actually confirmed by the recent demonstration of AC2 receptors being discovered on the surface of endothelial cells. As you know, this crazy COVID-19 sticks to the uh, ACT, angiotensin converting enzyme, two receptors, and triggers this cascade of injury, which a cytokine, uh, cytokine storm essentially permeates the vascular injury. And in addition to the increased vascular permeability, pulmonary edema, followed by inflammation. This is what usually comes in, in severe COVID-19. So this is the new pathogenesis, and because of uh, some of the vascular lesions persist longer, are predisposing to thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. I was very pleased to see that there will be a presentation this afternoon on the pulmonary emboli uh, detected in, in uh, COVID-19. Since we now are focusing with an international collaboration uh, on the long-term effects of long COVID, here is the demonstration of different distribution of symptoms. Again, so these are patients who have been healed and after four weeks or later come back with the new signs and symptoms. But the new signs and symptoms are completely different from the initial uh, uh, injury. 58% uh, of these people present with fatigue which cannot be explained by any other reason. 44% have headache, and they have other, uh, listed on the top right, other uh, symptoms, about one-fifth of the patient, loss of smell, loss of sensation, and so on. So this is an ongoing, very complex disease, in which uh, I, I was pleased that it will be a nice clinical presentation after mine, showing that indeed this is a, a, a very severe uh, disease. And what I learned now, actually discussing um, the incidence here in, in the level, 30% of COVID patients come down with long COVID, exactly the same statistic which we have in Long Beach. This was a study performed at the, uh, the University of California uh, investigation in Los Angeles and Long Beach. And this is, comes from a recent uh, long, uh, LA Times article because this was just released, so it's not published in peer review literature yet. And one on three pieces come down with long COVID. So this is a long-term public health um, uh, challenge for all of us all around the world. And exactly the same incidence in Lvov as in Los Angeles County. And what are these demonstrations? Again, very different from the initial pulmonary uh, injury where the acute patients demonstrate. This is a relatively recent study published in Lancet Psychiatry. It's a large study from England involving almost 400 patients. The huge difference in the various uh, uh, demonstration in these patients and changes. Intracranial hemorrhage, other major CVs, uh, these are very uh, severe cases, especially those which are uh, uh, longer lasting. So the longer the disease starts, the biggest of these demonstrations, and some of these patients will never pull out. Because of this ongoing long COVID story, uh, uh, there are several good publications. One was published in Nature Medicine, uh, just a few months ago, is the creation of so-called COVID-19 clinic. And this should be a multi-center, multifactorial clinic that covers several aspects of the disease. Not only the pulmonary, but the hematologic uh, consequences, renal diseases, uh, of course, pulmonary functions needs to be monitored. And this post-COVID 19 clinic is also used in our major international collaborative study, which is listed here. This is a major grant we submitted uh, two months ago for the USAID, United States for International Development, 
which stipulates that the United States takes put money in international collaboration if we follow uh, certain aspects of, of uh, COVID-19. And since long COVID is a prevalent, again, 30% of the patients are involved, we were very pleased, um, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Professor Zajaczkiewska, that Ukraine is present on this, along with three other European countries, Greece, Hungary, and Germany, two countries from Africa, Ghana, and South Africa, the poor, the black regions of South Africa, plus Malaysia, Mexico, and uh, United States is used for a comparison. And initial evaluation of this grant is pretty good. So if we get funding, some of the money might come here to, to level also to help to maintain such a, uh, a, maintain such a, a multidisciplinary COVID-19 study. And the US um, AID emphasizes not only medical consequences, but social epidemiological consequences and economic impact. That's the reason we have a, a very good collaborator from George Mason University in Washington, who is a, a, a member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, a very prominent, well-published economist is advising us, along with our team uh, in Long Beach and UCI, United University of California at Irvine. So very, very pleased if you have new co uh, collaborators from, from um, Levov, because the larger the study, most likely we will uh, produce some better results. So after all this multi-organ involvement, it's not surprising that uh, essentially COVID-19 is a new human stressor, a new agent which triggers a very severe disease. And this appeared to us um, very early, and we believe this will be the case. And essentially, that will confirm uh, what Hansel described early in experimental animals. And believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, we have to say that uh, after 70, 80 years after Hansel described it initially in animals, we confirm this exactly what is happening in humans. Very tragic case, and I will show you in a few minutes. And the, the demonstration for this the dia, the, uh, diagnostic tool, which now uses elevated cortisol in severe long-standing COVID patients. And the therapeutic effect of cortisol, because as stress has three stages, uh, in the uh, stage of uh, uh, alarm reaction after stage of resistance, when cortisol is elevated, but eventually the adrenal cortex is exhausted. And then cortisol level drops, and, and now there are good studies showing that if you give cortisol to those very severe COVID-19 patients, you prolong and you pull them out, uh, pull them out from the, uh, the clinical situation. And here are the uh, summarizes what Sergei was saying. He used the animals, mostly rats and mice, and he created the so-called triad of stress, which is in the lower right hand which involves, on the left-hand side, control uh, red uh, organs, on the right is after severe stress. So, adrenal glands are uh, enlarged and hyperemic dark. This is original picture from Hans Selye's book in 1952. At that time, there were no color pictures, but you can see the dark hyperemic adrenals on the, on the top. Uh, then the thymus and the lymph nodes shrink, we know this because of the influence release of, of, of uh, cortisol. And inside of the rat stomach, you have hemorrhagic erosion. So this morphologic triad, adrenal hyperemia enlargement, uh, gastrointestinal ulceration, and thymolymphatic atrophy are the morphologic uh, triad of stress. But more important, which is on the right, the three stages of stress response, which again, Hansel demonstrated in animals. During alarm reaction, there is a massive release of catecholamines, especially adrenaline. And as you know, adrenaline catecholamines has a very short half-life. They disappear from circulation in, in two, three minutes. And there is also in, in slowly increasing cortisol secretion in the alarm reaction. In stage of resistance, essentially catecholamines play no major role, but there is a sustained elevated level of cortisol in experimental animals. And you will see that's exactly which is now seeing in, in COVID uh, patients. And stage of ex exhaustion, cortisol level drops, 
because the, the adrenal cortical cells are exhausted. And the very first demonstration of uh, so the word stress actually said he used in 1950 because initially he called this general adaptation syndrome. And this is the, the signature of Hans Selye. When I finished PhD, I got this signed book from, from him. And although it was described the stress in animals in the 1930s and 40s, but in the 50s and 60s, there, it appeared that there are other major factors which are causing stress reaction in, in, uh, in the humans. And Selye himself put together uh, this the major human stressor list in the end of the 1970s. He died in 1982. And at that time, the top of human stressor was, of course, divorce, because that's really a stressful event, as some of us know very well. Loss of job and unemployment is a major stressor. Death of family and close friend is really a shaking experience for all of us, along with other decreasing in all dif difficulties in workplace, Lots of arguments with the boss, with your partner or boyfriend, good uh, uh, girlfriend, love of self-esteem, and so on. So these are the human st stressors before COVID-19. Now, enter COVID-19. Of course, these are major uh, multiple factors. First of all, on the top is fear of infection. That creates an anxiety. Then it, it uh, leads to reduced, reduced income as shows on the night, and unemployment, that's an additional stressor. If people are healthy and still working, higher workload creating an extra pressure. And if somebody, uh, uh, somebody dies in the family, that's of course it's a major stressor as we even uh, hinted before. All this creates social tensions and arguments and isolation. And this was uh, illustrated with one of uh, uh, Canadian painters. Some people tolerate stressors pretty well, others crumble and, and, and die. I'm, I'm pleased that in, the, in your medical uh, sciences journal, again, thanks to the invitation of Professor Zajacskiska, we predicted very early on that, that COVID-19, a new disease which started with chaos, chaos and panic, is associated with stress. And we published this more than a year ago, and new studies are actually confirming that this is the case. The new uh, publications came from the, again from the popular press a year, year and a half ago, when there was, it was so rapidly developing um, epidemiology and, and pandemic that uh, peer review papers came out. But there were very early uh, uh, good uh, signs that stress is a major complication of COVID-19 because stress shortages uh, push nations to uh, nurses to bring. Shortages of certain basic supplies create attention. Then school closures essentially add to stress level. And one of the most dramatic effect is that there are several studies now well documented stress can cause broken heart syndrome. This is the a de demonstration when probably you heard about, then there is no obvious morphologic sign of uh, uh, a cardiac disease and the patient drops dead. And this is usually caused by uh, severe cardiac arrhythmia. As a pathologist, I, I know that very demonstrate, very difficult to demonstrate any morphologic sign. This is what is happening more and more frequently in COVID-19 patients. And here is the biochemical demonstration. This is not just a concept. This is not just a soft talk. But there is an association between high serum and total cortisol concentration and mortality. The higher the cortisol level is more likely the patient essentially suffering from severe stress. And essentially, it will lead to adrenal cortical exhaustion and death. And this is well demonstrated in British study and resulting even a more recent publication just published a few months ago, the stress level may predict the mortality risk in patients. And it, again, this is a very firm study because you can measure, as they concluded, an increased cortisol level at a hospital admission for individuals with COVID-19 may serve as an independent predictor of the worst cause, essentially mortality. 
and uh, when you have the adrenal cortex stimulated for a long time, it will lead to essentially uh, insufficiency, it exhausted. So essentially, uh, there is a just published recently, this is one, but there are several, a new, uh, it's a very tragic case of 51 year old man, um, a gentleman confirmed with um, no COVID-19, and essentially had very low levels of cortisol. Fortun fortunately, there it was recognized clinically, they gave him cortisol and pulled, pulled him out. But the conclusion of this paper was in a BMG, British Medical Journal, that COVID-19 causes adrenal insufficiency and essentially is, uh, was led to a recent confirmation and other uh, good study showing that in the end of the uh, severe COVID-19 infection, the adrenal cortical function is lost. And here is a very good, difficult study which they controlled. ICU patients, intensive care unit patients, admitted for similar similarity, but different causes, different etiologic factor. One were non-COVID-19 patients, cortisol levels, and COVID-19 patients. The COVID-19 ICU patients had much lower level of cortisol. Again, demonstrated the three stages of stress reaction. High cortisol initially, but when it's long lasting, essentially uh, COVID-19 is causes such a severe uh, stimulation of adrenal cortex, essentially no cortisol is produced anymore. So they said they demonstrated that cortisol levels may are lower in critical ill patients with COVID-19 as compared to those of non-COVID critically uh, uh, ill patients. They also uh, emphasizes that the COVID stress syndrome or the post-COVID stress syndrome should be done by exclusion. So we do not want to imply stress in anywhere. You have to use, you have, you have to be sure that before you have to make a diagnosis of COVID stress syndrome, you rule out any other disease, any other condition. So you, can, you cannot just blame this on, on stress. You have to demonstrate there is no other organ lesion with this. Initially, when the post-COVID-19 stress syndrome was introduced, People mix this up with PTSD. They thought that PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, this is the same story. But this study very nicely demonstrates it is not. One crucial distinction is because COVID-19 is an ongoing pandemic. This is still worries a lot of people. Fear and anger is created. So this is ongoing. As opposed to PTSD, which is a traumatic stress reaction to past event, so past historic event, that's the big difference. The PTSD, long-standing historic, something war trauma or something, but, but the uh, COVID-19 stress syndrome is ongoing in our life. So uh, let's finish it with a, a, a conclusion. Here is uh, one of the most recent discovery published in the June 25 issue of Science. And here is a picture of the mother of This is the Hungarian lady I mentioned in the introduction who discovered the, the basis for messenger RNA uh, vaccines, Katalin Koriko, uh, who almost got the Nobel Prize uh, this Monday, but eventually probably she will get it next time. This is from a, a German newspaper, I think, was the Welt or Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, just uh, two weeks ago, uh, calling her the mother of, uh, of new biotechnology. But look what her vaccinated led to. This is a new concept which is now being em emphasized and introduced in scientific community, the new hybrid immunity. Hybrid immunity, which has nothing to do with uh, uh, herd immunity. Herd immunity is the population where 80% of the population is uh, uh, immune, then you have a good protection against progression of any infectious disease. But Hybrid immunity is very different because this is used actually from botany, for plant biology. People knew that if you combine uh, several uh, strands of uh, plants, you create a stronger plant. And this is now actually being reproduced in immunology because you could have natural immunity based on na natural immune system. 
if you get COVID, uh, a vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine, you increase your immunity. Not only in, in B cells, which simply is the antibodies, but even uh, T lymphocytes, CD4 and CD8 uh, uh, T lymphocytes, which essentially kill the infected cells. So this is a big initial uh, difference because most of the natural immunity is based only on, on, on memory B cells producing antibodies. But here you introduce killer cells, and if you combine the two, you get this hybrid immunity, which is about 10 to 25% higher. So this is a new concept. Uh, pay attention to this because you will, we will hear about more about this. So the final is, uh, conclusion is that Let's not forget that COVID-19, especially long COVID-19, is a very serious disease. We always said from the very beginning, and, and we, um, uh, Oksana can confirm we said this in initial publication a year ago, that COVID-19 may fade away, but will never go away. This will be sticking with us like the flu. We, we have the annual flu influenza series because we started with a major outbreak 100 years ago. So COVID-19 is stay with us. But other important conclusion is that the signs and symptoms of acute COVID-19 were mostly pulmonary, and they are very different from the long, uh, long COVID uh, the presentation, which is neurologic and, and uh, vascular. Keep in mind the hybrid immunity. And again, I invite you to look at the science just uh, a good month ago, two months ago, uh, June 29, June 25th issue. This a combination of natural immunity with vaccination. It leads to a very good resistance and hybrid immunity. I, I hope I demonstrated to you from multiple studies that COVID-19 stress syndrome involves mostly the adrenal cortex. And initially, the cortisol secretion is increased. So most of the severe COVID-19 patients I advise you such as measure cortisol. And in ICU cases, cortisol is critically low lower than other ICU patients, and this is actually a predictor of mortality. So the multifactorial origin of COVID-19 is a definite a new human stressor. This is not just a concept, but actually, unfortunately, patients are dying with adrenal insufficiency. So the old man, Hans Eri, my teacher, was right, unfortunately. The three stages of stress reaction can be demonstrated now 70, 80 years later not only in experimental animals, mice and rats, but also in, in humans. So this is Hans Seri himself on the right. Uh, this was in the early 1970s when I was a PhD student, uh, much better looking with nicer, darker hair than now. And at the center, this lady is uh, Yvette Taché, uh, who is full professor at UCLA. She was the 40th and last student. And that's on the right is the last picture of Hans Seri, who died uh, in uh, 1982. So thank you for your attention, and I hope I, I was able to convince you that it's worth to study uh, COVID-19, especially since there is so much similarity about the incidents, uh, both in the United States, in Los Angeles, and here in Lebo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Santos. And session open for the questions. Maybe some questions to Professor Shabo, uh, Professor Luncina. Microphone. Uh, today's uh, uh, COVID epidemic. My question is regarding the hybrid immunity. Is that only in those that have been infected and therefore produce their natural? immunity and then add vaccination to it? Uh, it's, very, it's still a developing concept, it's very new. Uh, my understanding initially for the science article, it can occur even without any infections. So just based on natural immunity in people who will never get in touch with COVID-19. But if you get vaccination, that's enough to boots in. But now new studies emerging that uh, are not well published yet, but just very, very preliminary results I've seen that you have natural immunity. If you get a mild infection, your antibody levels are higher and long lasting, especially the IgG. IgM drops very quickly, but IgG remains. And if you that adds to vaccination, then 
Accenture, you get 25% stronger immunity, hybrid immunity. And that uh, uh, contradicts the, some people initial advice that if you get infected, you should not get vaccination. Just the opposite, you must get it because that creates to, to hybrid immunity. And another misconception uh, in that one who's already had an infection and has measurable antibodies, uh, I have heard that uh, they do not uh, recommend vaccination while you have that higher level. But you, you said just the opposite. Obviously, that's the time to get the vaccination. Definitely. And then another question is, um, uh, now that we're at the stage where booster shots will be, are available and are recommended, yes. uh, can this also be part of the hybrid immunity? In other words, it's going to boost your immunity even higher. It is. Very good, very good uh, thought, well, uh, Professor Antia. It is actually, that's one of the many reasons that we recommend booster shot. Not in every, every um, vaccine. And here is the one is a funny story, which essentially in such a rapidly developing field, nobody knew initially the whole story. I didn't know, uh, maybe you, you knew, that the uh, the, the two initial mRNA vaccines, one was introduced by Pfizer, the other was by Moderna. The Moderna vaccine has two to three times more uh, mRNA than the, Pfizer, than, the, than the Pfizer. We didn't know this until a few weeks ago. And that's the reason it came out when the FDA got the study. They got the first uh, uh, the booster shot for Pfizer because they knew it damn well that the vaccine was much smaller. With Moderna, which I got it at UCI, and not because I, I choose it, but UCI just gave Moderna, my antibodies are, um, are very high because of Moderna. But eventually, Moderna, we gave a booster shot also because of this uh, hybrid immunity. And again, the booster shots will come from most of it, mRNA vaccine, uh, Pfizer or Moderna, but essentially will be followed by DNA vaccines also, the Oxford, Zeneca, or the Johnson Johnson United States. Thank you very much. Other questions? Um, Dr. Shabo, I would like to ask sure. you. First of all, thank you very much for so excellent presentation with updates about COVID-19 and also description about long COVID in the modern point of view. What do you think about the physiological predictors to get this long COVID-19? Uh, two factors immediately, but initially we think about antibodies because that's the rapid response secreted by B cell. But more studies um, uh, uh, confirm that we have to measure the T lymphocytes also, especially CD4 and CD8, because that is a good uh, physiological predictor. Because it's not enough to, to neutralize the virus, but once the virus infects the cells, it is the T lymphocyte, uh, T lymphocyte which will kill the infected cells. So one of the other predictors is that I don't want to say forget about the antibodies, but measure also CD4, and the other is cortisol. Cortisol, that's especially if the patients are hospitalized. Now we suggest that to everybody to measure cortisol levels. If it starts to drop, then give uh, extra shoots of uh, cortisol or any, any synthetic uh, glucocorticoid because that will pull out the patients from severe crisis. So thank you very much. Other questions? No, thank you very much. Sure.